right. Good morning and welcome to BSA's virtual event on transatlantic data transfers. What will a new EU-US agreement mean for the US economy? Co-organized by BSA and the Global Data Alliance. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Kate Goodlow, Senior Policy Director at BSA, the Software Alliance. BSA is a global trade association and we represent the enterprise software industry. We're based in DC and active in more than 30 countries. Our members, including companies like Workday and SAP who are with us today, have long supported policies that promote the responsible transfer of data across borders. And it's really difficult to overstate just how important it is for companies of all sizes and in all industries to transfer data across international borders. In sectors from agriculture to advanced manufacturing, companies that are going through digital, digital transformation have very different business models, but they all share the need to transfer data across borders. And they do so in ways that grow economies, help citizens and businesses access new markets, create jobs at home, and that promote productivity and safety. This issue of transferring data internationally is actually so cross-cutting that three years ago, BSA launched a cross-industry group called the Global Data Alliance, or the GDA, which brings together companies and industries as diverse as agriculture, aviation, finance, healthcare, and manufacturing to focus exclusively on data transfers. GDA members are from Asia, Europe, South America, and the United States, and they include household names like Panasonic, Lego, and AT&T and Medtronic, who are also with us today. So today, BSA and GDA members have come together to talk about the importance of international data transfers and to explain what a new agreement that supports US-EU data transfers means for the US economy. So to get us started, I'm going to give a brief update on the status of that new agreement to frame our discussion. In March, President Biden and Ursula von der Leyen, who's president of the European Union, announced a political agreement on a new framework to support data transfers between the EU and the US. The new agreement is designed to create a successor to the Privacy Shield, which was a voluntary program overseen by the US Commerce Department. Companies that join Privacy Shield committed to enforceable privacy safeguards to ensure that they transfer data consistent with legal requirements. The European Court of Justice struck down the Privacy Shield, not based on privacy commitments that were made by those companies, but based on concerns about US surveillance practices. Now, BSA participated in that case as an amicus, and the case actually upheld the ability for companies to transfer data using other safeguards, but the privacy shield could no longer be used as a basis for transferring data between the EU and the US. Since then, the US and EU have worked together really closely to create a new privacy framework to support data transfers and to replace the privacy shield consistent with legal frameworks and obligations on both sides of the Atlantic. In the new EU-US data privacy framework is the result. Earlier this month, President Biden signed an executive order marking another significant step toward operationalizing that new agreement. In addition to creating new safeguards on intelligence activities, the executive order also creates a new redress process for enforcing those safeguards. Going forward, there are still several critical steps before a new agreement is put into place to support data transfers between the EU and the US. The agreement will require what the European Commission uh, calls an adequacy of determination. And the next step now is for the commission to publish a draft of that determination. And we expect that to be a focus in the coming months. But today, what we wanna focus on is why this matters and what effect a new agreement will have on the US economy. Because this issue of transferring data internationally doesn't just matter to technology companies. This is an issue that is critical to all companies that use technology, which really is all companies today. So with all of that said, I'm finally going to turn to our panelists. And before I do that, I wanna remind everyone in our audience that we want this conversation to be interactive for as much as possible. So as you have questions for our speakers, please send them to us using the chat function. So now I'm gonna to turn to our terrific panelists and I wanna ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and explain why the EU-US data privacy framework is important to their organization. Uh, we're gonna start with Barbara Cosgrove, Vice President and Chief Privacy Officer at Workday. So Barbara, welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you for pulling this together and for having me on the panel. Um, so maybe I can do a really brief introduction to Workday as I think that shows why this is such an important issue to us. Um, Workday is a leading provider of enterprise cloud applications for finance and human resources. Our applications have been adopted by thousands of organizations around the world and across industries, including more than 50% of the Fortune 500. And so looking at from a global company perspective and having companies around the world, um, robust data transfer mechanisms are crucial to serving our global customers who rely on the HR and financial applications to run their business. And we also rely on it ourselves as a global company in terms of operating our own business. So it's not just from the customer perspective, it's also for us as a global company. Um, we're a company that was built in the cloud. And so strong privacy protections have always been very important to us. We take privacy and security very important as a company. And, and we want a long lasting framework to be able to help us continue to look forward to the future with global data transfers. So we're very pleased that the data privacy framework will offer strong protections for personal data going forward. And this is critical to ensuring the durability of it as a data transfer mechanism. Thank you, Barbara. Our next panelist is Jake Jennings, Assistant Vice President and Head of Global Trade Policy at AT&T. Welcome, Jake. Oh, thank you so much. And, and thank you to, uh, to Global Data Alliance for organizing this, this wonderful panel and giving us an opportunity to to uh, present our views. So just some, some framework, AT&T is a global communications provider. We provide VPN service, a so virtual private network service to enterprise customers in over 200 countries. We have over 1.4 million miles of fiber landing in countries throughout the world. And over our network, we see approximately 535 petabytes, again, petabytes of traffic on an average business day. So the usage is only increasing every day. The, the EU framework uh, that, that the US was able to work through with the executive order and the next steps will be crucial to not just AT&T, but our customers, our suppliers, uh, anyone who is doing business both in Europe and globally. Now, one thing to, to flag for folks is data flows are under attack uh, globally. Uh, they, so much so that they've been a key issue of trade agreements. Uh, U.S. was able to include strong provisions in the USMCA agreement, the U.S.-Japan agreement, and even the uh, Comprehensive uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TPP, uh, in Asia uh, has strong provisions on, on data flows. We've seen it in the G7, uh, led by Japan, and their uh, trusted data flows, and now we're seeing it raised through the U.S. and the uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework. So the more we're able to establish a, a solid basis framework for trusted data flows, I think will benefit everyone. And if I could just you know, turn to, to one organization, National Association of Manufacturing, uh, who has you know, tremendous members throughout out the organization, they actually put a tweet out uh, calling, uh, supporting the Biden administration's executive order on enhancing safeguards for the US signals intelligence activities as a key step for implementing the US EU data privacy framework that will quote, boast competitiveness, restore certainty for manufacturers that depend on, on data flows. And it's not just our customers. We also use the data flows to protect uh, the AT&T network from a network management perspective and a cybersecurity perspective. So I don't think it's, it's an understatement to say that it's crucial for all US EU businesses to have free flow of data and working through this wonderful framework. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. There's so much to talk about today. And I think you raised a number of the points that we want to dig into as this conversation continues. Uh, I want to introduce next Joe Omaruku, who is Lead Senior Legal Counsel, Data Protection and Privacy at SAP North America. So welcome, Thanks. Joe. Thanks, Kate, and thanks for having me. Uh, obviously, I'm a corporate attorney focused on privacy topics, but I'm also the, the representative of our global data protection officer here for the US and Canada. Uh, we're also an enterprise uh, software leader, products designed to make the lives of uh, normal real economy businesses easier to, to, to streamline and simplify their administrative tasks so they can instead focus on their real business, their product, their service, their expansion. We have uh, thousands of customers across the US that are you know, small to medium enterprises 
your manufacturers, your your local service providers uh, of of all sizes, but but certainly including smaller enterprises, is the kind of the, the backbone of the U.S. economy, the the job creators, the the future giants. I hope uh, in many scenarios. Um, I think really, you know, to, to keep it short, this new agreement represents a certain comfort in predictability uh, for for what's to come in the future knowing that this topic is genuinely being prioritized at the most senior level, knowing that it's understood at the most senior levels, knowing that the businesses can back, get back to their real business, uh, you know, rather than this, this challenge, this fear, this uncertainty. Uh, and obviously the, the hope here is that it, it opens, but not only opens, but jams open forever, uh, the door, the, the access door to, to markets, global markets, sales opportunities, and therefore for the real economy, uh, real jobs, real workers. Right, thank you, Joe. Uh, and finally, I want to introduce our last panelist, Jim Southwick, who is Vice President of Government Affairs at Medtronic. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, Kate, and thanks for this opportunity. Uh, Medtronic may not be a, a household name to many because we are we're not a consumer direct to consumer business, but we're a, a, the world's leading medical technology a company um, based out of Minneapolis and uh, ninety five thousand employees worldwide and. We, we make implanted medical devices. We're the pioneers of cardiac pacemakers and heart valves and stents and uh, a lot of equipment in the operating room that goes beep uh, and monitors you and uh, spine surgery and brain surgery and um, a, a lot of these type of medical products. And um, uh, we have a statistic that um, uh, twice every second, um, two times per second, somebody in the world is um, uh, getting uh, or is having use of Medtronic uh, uh, technology, benefiting from Medtronic technology to give you a sense of the scale. And our, and our patients and the clinicians using our products are in, in countries um, all over the world. And like every other major company, um, our systems and our ability to do uh, operations depends on data transfers. Um, uh, we have Workday, uh, we, our systems run on SAP, and my uh, company phone is AT&T Service. Um, and uh, so uh, all these sort of, uh, and, and communicating and working with our employees and customers and patients around the world, we use all, um, all those um, data transfer and fundamental systems. But there's another aspect, which is which I, we can go into more detail in the discussion, which is in actually the application of healthcare. Uh, how important um, data transfers are for the research and innovation that is um, bringing new healthcare uh, products to the market, how important it is for global safety monitoring of all, of all of our technology and all these patients around the world, and how important it is for patient support. Uh, as well, and, and assisting in patient care. Um, so that uh, the, the um, privacy framework, uh, privacy shield is, as others have said, uh, very important to increasing the confidence and the ability um, to develop technology and serve patients on a, on a global basis, but especially in the very large markets between the US and Europe. Thank you, Jim. I think that really tees up the, the part that we're going to move to now, which I think of as the fun part of our discussion uh, about all of these issues. And I want to just kick off that discussion by starting with, you know, explaining why international data transfers are just so important to all types of companies doing businesses in the U.S. And, you know, I, I have questions that I, I want to pose to each of you, but I really do want to make this a conversation. And so I, I want to invite all of the panelists to sort of add in and expand on uh, all of these points as we talk about them. But Jim, just to, to put the first question to you, and you mentioned that there are examples of why international data transfers matter in the healthcare space, but can you explain to people who may not focus on this issue in their sort of daily life, what it actually means to transfer data internationally? Like how do we see those transfers in our daily activities? Yeah, so let me uh, kind of expand on the three categories I mentioned. So if you think about a, a cardiac pacemaker, uh, think of it like a cell phone. It's a has battery, it has semiconductors, and has software. It just happens to be implanted in your chest. And you know, new models come out uh, frequently, but a tremendous amount of data is gathered and it's transmitted 
uh, as it monitors your and, and helps uh, regulate your heart. It also collects and provides huge amounts of data to your doctor, which are transferred uh, by internet. And you could be monitored 24 seven and uh, the doctor can be reading uh, what was happening in your chest when you slept last night. And all this kind of digital technology, digital innovation is the frontier of healthcare. Uh, now artificial intelligence is entering more and more into devices, not only so that we're observing what's happening in your body in real time, but you start to collect um, data of uh, patient of thousands and thousands of patients and their patterns and um, the, the outcomes. And you can actually start to predict uh, um, and avoid incidences. So we're working on algorithms that will help predict the risk of stroke, not only observe, oh, you're having a stroke, but there is now an increased risk that you might have it so that you can see your doctor and, and maybe change your medications or change something else to help reduce that risk. The, these, types of, these types of research projects depend on access to big data in, a, in highly secure and trusted environments, um, but, um, uh, but from, uh, from patients uh, in, in, in research, uh, involved in research in different countries of the world. But the researchers doing the research are sitting in Minneapolis. And, and so we have to be able to you know, pull together the big data for that. Another aspect that I mentioned was patient safety. It's a, you'll be pleased to know it's an obligation and we're happy to have the obligation that we need to be perpetually monitoring everywhere our products are used. Um, and we need to be gathering that data and analyzing it, looking as they say for a signal in the noise, is there, is there something that happened to some patient uh, is there, that tell us that maybe there's an, something we have to look into about our products and we need to be reporting that to the US FDA as we do it. Um, and uh, if we see a problem, we have to go out and, and sometimes do a correction, do a software update or, or, or tell doctors uh, to change um, the way they're using the equipment. This is all very, very important again, and we are required to be doing that on a worldwide basis. We need to know where that product was and 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 in which patient and, and how it was used so that we can actually uh, track the safety. So that's an, another example. And then the third category is it's supporting patients and treatment. Um, I mentioned the way that your, your pacemaker may be monitoring your heart. What if you go on a trip to Europe? Uh, uh, and you want uh, your, your doctor still to be watching how you're uh, st stressed under jet lag. Are you doing all right? That's an international data transfer in your in your therapy as well. So um, yeah, it is increasingly, increasingly important. Thank you, Jeff. I think those are really helpful examples, both illustrating the need to develop products and research them based on data mm -hmm. that may be uh, in different countries and, and pulling it together to enable you to do that and then monitoring products after they're developed. Mm -hmm. uh, I, your context is obviously in the, in the healthcare and medical field, but those needs seem to exist much more broadly too. And I wanna open it up to any other panelists that might uh, you know, have specific examples of cross-border data transfers if they wanna sort of highlight for our audience. Yeah, I, I can jump in with one that, you know, it's it's a simple one I think that many companies have. If, if you look at our customers, they're businesses that use Workday to manage their finances and global workforce. And so just looking at something like how a global company closes their books a quarter end, if they're a, a multinational company, there's going to have to be international data transfers to, to be able to do something like that. Um, in addition to using all of the global human resources and payroll. But I think, you know, we, we don't often talk about those use cases where it's really just trying to, to close books at year end. It requires the data to be transferred back and forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really helpful point. And also, you know, ties in the, the basic need of companies that operate in more than one country to transfer data simply to do things like payroll and administer benefits. Yeah, Kate, uh, I, you know, following up on Jim's example, and Jim, thank you for being a valued AT&T customer. <laughs> uh, imagine if you're in Europe and you're not able to roam, uh, that, that's simple. Uh, having that connectivity, that instant access, able to access your apps in a, in a secure manner, I think is, is front and center on kind of the opportunity cost that we face absent this, this agreement, uh, this putting the safety. And I remember having a, a similar conversation with a, a certain official in Asia where they were looking at doing some data localization requirements. Uh, and I just remember saying, well, how, how would you like us to pay invoices? How would you like us to complete service? And they didn't really have a good answer for that. And we were fortunate that they did not move forward. But I think as more and more economies work through the implications 
of the inability to transfer data, the more they're realizing that, in fact, yes, you do need to allow it in a, a secure manner. And the alternative is unthinkable, uh, to, to, to be honest. Uh, you know, I think I really like this call today that there's, you know, we're avoiding a lot of the buzzwords and the legal, uh, the, you know, legal lingo and the acronyms. And I think that's really important because, uh, you know, I think when you speak outside of maybe privacy circles sometimes about data transfers, you know, maybe the impression is given that there's a big database created and we, we agree that, you know, next week we're going to send that database over to America. Uh, you know, not at all. It, 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 it's a free flow of, you know, this call is probably a data transfer. I'm, I'm sure some of the folks listening in who might ask a question, you know, so absolutely. I think it's really valuable to, to maybe look at some hyper simplistic examples just to make sure people are It's great to hear your example about Robert, the HR and, you know, finance and, and, and payment. Uh, I mean, think of a small manufacturer, you know, uh, maybe uh, interested in access to the, the, the 300,000 or 300 million uh, people economy, potentially 300 million new customers in Europe, uh, you know, uh, pure basic topics like they were, how, how do they search for potential customers? <laughs> data transfer, uh, potential partners, potential suppliers, data transfer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, they find someone, they want to contact them, data transfer. Mm -hmm, <laughs> uh, you know, mm -hmm. basic advertisement, they want to visit them, uh, working with them, even sending them an email. I mean, all of these things, we don't think of them as data transfers, but, but they do technically involve data transfers, uh, you know, getting paid at the end of the day. Obviously, it's it's <laughs> the, the primary goal, uh, but, but something as silly as, you know, writing the, the, the address label in order to send them the product. If you're a manufacturer, you know, you have to get the address so some kind of a data transfer there or you know maybe a, a company that's that next step up uh, it's expanded in into i mean obviously europe is the example for today but 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 wherever um and maybe it decides well it, it's time for us to set up a you know a, a sales office establish a sales office somewhere in europe and then barbara we're, we're to your examples <laughs> you know we, we we need to to, to review resumes uh, data transfer we need to make sure we can pay them process payroll taxes corporate taxes you know <laughs> i mean back to our unthinkable alternative you know do, do we want a scenario where that sales rep on his uh, his or her own in, in europe can't actually tell us the list of, of potential customers they're working on i mean it, it, it's almost un unrealistic um you know billing banking all these basic fundamental mm -hmm. crucial daily business activities that a normal person you know not in the normal life involved in in privacy or data transfer conversations wouldn't even consider to be data transfers um but but ultimately they're, they're they're absolutely critical for for economic development and you know uh, i think with jake at your point in particular the 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 alternative the unthinkable alternative is localization or or simply no transfer uh, both of which are non-options realistically for the future um and, and i think you know coming back to why we're having this conversation today you know, it, it, it's really good timing. Uh, you know, it's more important than ever that we have new, simple, and, and cheap, uh, you know, more and more simplistic options available. And uh, I know I'm pushing the small and medium enterprise here, but, you know, there are alternatives available for data transfer, but they're relatively burdensome and potentially they work well for larger corporations like the, the four of us on the call today. But if, if you're a, you know, a manufacturer with two or three products and 15 employees, um, standard contractual clauses are, are quite, a, quite, quite a challenge. Um, you know, and, and really, uh, I think it's, it's great to see businesses getting that focus on this topic, that comfort on this topic. And, you know, they're the folks that us, as a policy perspective, you know, all across the country want to see succeed and need to see succeed. So I think it's, it's really great that we have this new option back on the table uh, in, in, in privacy shield for the future. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I think, you know, those points highlight a lot of issues that we want to dig into. And I want to come back to the, the concerns about small and medium enterprises. But a number of the things that you just sort of listed as examples of data transfers that, that companies need to do to find their customers, to send invoices, all of those strike me as things that, that really help your company and other companies in transferring data, you know, create jobs and serve customers in the United States. Uh, is that right? And can you talk about how important it is for those transfers to companies that are looking to serve customers in the U.S. to create jobs here? Sure. I mean, it, it can't be more critical. I mean, at the end of the day, if, if you're a, an American manufacturer or, or service provider, and of course, you know, you've, you've expanded across the U.S., you, your next option, uh, you know, uh, 
300 million potential customers. I mean, the idea that we would have an unthinkable alternative where they can't be contacted or, or you can't work with them, you know, it's, 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 it's an obvious barrier to trade. It's, a, you know, it's, a, it's, um, it's simply just unacceptable. We need to be able to work together from the European perspective of my homeland and also my, my, my current residence in the US for, for over 10 years now. Um, you know, ultimately, businesses can't expand the potential impact on, on the, the economy on both sides of the Atlantic, but a global economy, were we to, to continue to move towards what was feared for a while, this hyper-localization approach. Uh, it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the only potential impact is, is negative, in my view, uh, on businesses of all sizes. Yeah. I, obviously, we want to get privacy right, for sure, and we want the safeguards to be there. And the, that's everything I've said is not to take away from that. Everyone that's already agreed, and that's a prerequisite that we not only want to do things because they're legally required, but also because they're the right thing to do. But we also do need to find, you know, workable solutions. And, and that's why, mm -hmm. I guess, in particular, this conversation and, and the past months have been really positive to see, you know, uh, solutions that maybe are a better size fit for smaller corporations uh, so that they can not be intimidated or afraid to expand outside their national borders. Yeah, thank you, Joe. And I think that conversation around safeguards and what are the right safeguards uh, really highlights the importance of finding mechanisms that do enable companies to, to transfer data internationally consistent with their obligations, consistent with the sort of legal requirements and other safeguards that they need to have in place. I wanna to turn to Barbara now and ask how a mechanism like the former Privacy Shield or something like the new EU US data privacy framework can help companies do that as they transfer data internationally. Sure. So as a software service provider, we've always offered our customers multiple ways to transfer the data to Workday between regions um, so that they can bring their, their global data together to do their payroll and benefits and finances we were talking about. Um, and so we've always offered multiple frameworks, whether it's standard contractual clauses, which is a contractual way of using it, or um, binding corporate rules. But we were also one of the first companies that had certified to the Privacy Shield. And so looking forward, once the EU issues, and I'm going to say issues because I'm going to be optimistic and I believe this is going to happen, <laughs> issues and adequacy determination for the new data privacy framework, will be able to offer this framework as another transfer mechanism alongside these other tools to our customers. And um, many of our customers, um, when we were able to offer Privacy Shield as a data transfer mechanism, preferred that mechanism due to the simplicity and due to the fact that it's really an endorsement by governments. Um, it's, you know, all of them have, all the data transfer mechanisms have their own benefits that having the, the actual government to government agreement and then having a company go and put their program and certify to the government um, has some weight behind it too. So I, I, we will be able to offer that as another data transfer mechanism along with the, the SECs and the BCRs. Great, thank you, Barbara. And I know a, a couple of you have already touched on the different types of companies that need to transfer data internationally, the different industry sectors that they're in, the different sizes of those companies. But I want to turn to Jake, and then I might, you know, encourage all panelists to chime in on this too, just to ask about you know why this issue is so critical for companies of all sizes and in all sectors of the U.S. economy. Uh, Jake, can you help us understand why that is and why so many different types of companies and in different industries depend on this ability to transfer data internationally? Well, it, it's, you know, if I could cut quite simply, it's, it's the ability to do business, uh, to sell products, to manage services, to manage customers, uh, employees, uh, suppliers across the board. Uh, and one, one statistic that I think is, is very important is before the, the Shrimps 2 case came out, Joe, sorry to to talk about the, the legal side, but <laughs> before that came out, you had over you know 5,300 small companies that had signed up um, with Department of Commerce under Privacy Shield. And that was a registration uh, process. This is how we're gonna treat data uh, securely uh, through, through that, as opposed to what a lot of large businesses do through standard contractual clauses, where we would have a contract with our customer, we go through that and we spell out how uh, AT&T will, will protect the data and adhere to uh, GDPR. So having this ability is crucial 
for, for small businesses just simply to, to do business. And, and I want to go back to the NAM quote. Uh, you know, the, the fact that a, a trade association who is focused on manufacturers is so closely tracking uh, the privacy issues globally, uh, but also importantly with, with the EU, speaks volumes of the importance of this issue. Kate, I'll, I'll, I'll chime in. And first on the on the question of the overall economic impact, just to sort of uh, give a, a specific example. So Medtronic, about half of our sales are outside the U.S., um, but we have 43 manufacturing plants in the U.S. where all uh, high-tech manufacturing with all of our sort of most critical components are made in the U.S. And we do have also then some manufacturing in Europe. Uh, but our ability to support, and, and most of our critical R&D is done in the US, you know, very highly paid scientists um, as well. Our, our ability to support and drive all that engine in US manufacturing, US research and development depends on our ability to sell in foreign markets. It's simply if you took away the foreign market, which you take away half our business, we would shrink um, in the US. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's, it's important to, to see that. The, um, the privacy shield, as others have been saying, really does help enable, even for big companies, even if we're not using the privacy shield directly, it's benefiting us indirectly because there's a lot of burden in using st standard contractual clauses, um, having to do risk assessments and and there's a practical issues with protect with uh, persuading customers that um, we, we really will meet the requirements. Uh, using uh, standard contractual clauses, especially if you think if you're transferring health data, right? That's obviously among the most sensitive data. People are, the hospitals are going to want to know, uh, and they may not be that sophisticated on on what U.S. national security practices are. So, they, having having the uh, um, the privacy shield in place, even if we're using standard contractual clauses, greatly increases the efficiency and lowers the burden and cost. For, um, for continuing the business in Europe, which is really important to us. And I can imagine that for companies not as large as we, those are those, uh, as Joe was pointing out, those benefits uh, either inside or outside of the privacy shield are just going to be very, very important for easing the burden, Im improving the confidence of, of, of partners and, and customers and, and uh, lowering cost. I think also just, just to jump onto that, uh, looking back over the last couple of years and how companies had to pivot to remote work and you know, um, digital transformation has just been embraced by more and more organizations and technology and data are now so intertwined with running a business. But to do that, moving data is fundamental to that. And in order to have a digital transformation, you, you must have data transfer mechanisms. So regardless of the size of the company, this has become a key issue for all of us. All right, I wanna talk next about that, the sort of inverse issue. Uh, and Jim, I guess I'll put this one to you, but suppose that there were just no way to transfer data across the Atlantic. Mm -hmm. What would that actually mean for your business, for your customers? Yeah, there's, I mean, as, as everyone has said, it's, it's a huge, it would be a huge negative impact. Um, it'd be very, very difficult to carry on the business. You actually see, versions of this already happening with data localization requirements, right? The requirement that the data has to be kept on a local ser server and can't be transferred internationally. Um, that imposes millions and millions of dollars of extra cost. And I think, um, ironically, it actually reduces security of the data. The, the more places, the more different systems and servers you're, you're, you're serving data on, the more weak points that are potentially for um, for a security failure, uh, so um, it, each time a country says no, the data can't can't leave here. It must be on our servers. So we, we have to invest on building servers in in that country and and localizing all data in, in, in that in that country. Um, it's it's millions and millions of dollars. And of course, even with that, just as others have explained, to operate, we're still we still have to contact our customers and employees. We still have to manage our our HR systems. There are there are data transfers are absolutely necessary for the business, even with uh, with the localization requirements. 
you wanted a very extreme example, but uh, near Orwellian, I, I guess, you know, in theory, you'd have to have a, a local entity in that other place that that mm -hmm. does everything completely locally with with minimal contact with the parent company. I'm not sure how uh, duties yeah. of oversight and governance, etc., could could possibly work in that scenario. But um, you know, uh, we're not there, thankfully. We, we, you know, I, I don't think the consumer on the street wants it. I don't think businesses on the street want it. I think it's important to distinguish between good, high quality, you know, privacy controls and standards. Th th this isn't a, you know, a, a kind of a pushback against that at all. It's rather about you know, finding a balance that's realistic to ensure the adequate safeguards are there, but also to ensure that uh, you know, businesses and also people, uh, you know, uh, humans can call their, their mother in Ireland, uh, you know, or wh whatever it is, uh, uh, you know, to build those relationships, because sometimes it's, it's those, you know, uh, friendly relationships that build to those business relationships that ultimately bring about that, that expansion, that opportunity, that awareness of, of that opportunity, you know, and, and back to, to Jim, your, your point, if, if half of your market was cut off, I mean, Mm -hmm. it probably means half of your, your researchers are, uh, jobs are, are, are in debate. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. certainly uh, the idea that we would have to split um, and not be able to access certain markets would probably also uh, a huge challenge for, for very small jurisdictions. Uh, you know, potentially larger businesses might simply make the call that there's not enough benefit in us going in there uh, because they're not a large enough market. So that'd be obviously devastating for both the folks there and also for the lost revenue for uh, you know the, the company involved but uh, you know I think again we have multiple options it's great to have these options the focus of the conversation is very much Europe your US today but it's a broader global topic and I think you know the, the, the mindset idea of you know extreme localization it, it doesn't really uh, properly correlate with the reality of, of business operations on the ground Okay, if, if I can, one, one example or two examples I've seen, one is fraud detection. Uh, imagine if you didn't have uh, the ability to simultaneously you know, review uh, payment processing globally. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had a credit card transaction occurring in Spain at the exact same time it was occurring in the UK, at the exact same time it was occurring in South Carolina, absent data flows, all three of those uh, payments would be processed. So, you know, you can't be in physically in the same place in three, you know, if, you know three areas. So there, there's an example. The other one we've seen is uh, we offer a service um, where we track shipments using what's called a global SIM card that roams globally. So you've got a shipment going from, from the UK uh, to the US uh, or Singapore. Well, if that shipment is damaged, through this service, you're able to see through the, the data that's collected, the temperature, the, uh, you know, the accelerometer, uh, if that uh, shipment drops, say in Singapore, you could actually identify when did it occur, at what time, possibly who was operating the crane and be able to identify this is where it, it, the, pro, the, uh, the damage occurred. Absent data flows, you, know, you may have to wait weeks or months for to get that information back. So it's the ability of the innovative of, you know, services that not just that we're able to offer, but small businesses as well. Yeah, thank you all. I, I think those examples really illustrate just how intertwined international data transfers are with so many facets of what companies do and, and frankly, what their customers expect. Uh, and it's always helpful to have those practical illustrations of this term, which can sound you know, very amorphous, but it really weaves itself into so many aspects of uh, companies' practices and, and individuals' lives. Uh, Barbara, I wanna to turn to you next because your company is an enterprise software company. So you create the software and digital tools that other companies rely on. How do international data transfers help your business customers? Um, can you sort of explain the benefits of data transfers from a B2B perspective? And others might wanna chime in on this too, but Barbara, um, can you start that conversation? 
Sure. And I think I touched on a couple of these already, but but at a high level, the, the magic of Workday is enabling our customers to bring their data across the entire enterprise together. And so whether it's the HR, the, the payroll, the benefits from finance to planning and sourcing into one single system. And so they're able to do the analytics efficiently. They're able to do reporting. They're able to see across their entire workforce. And none of this would be possible if there wasn't data transfers that enabled them to, to bring that together to do all of the global, the global reporting. Um, and that's, that's for them to operate their, their business. But then the data transfers are also key to how we're able to provide the service to them as an enterprise provider, a B2B provider. Um, it touches on some of what, what Jake was saying in terms of being able to make sure that we're providing best in class security controls um, that we're able to monitor around the globe, um, that we're able to provide support to them from around the globe. Um, even that access to data is a data transfer in order to be able to help respond and you know, at their direction, um, be able to go and help them work through an issue that's a data transfer. And so without it, it would be really challenging to provide um, best in class security as well as uh, support for, for the multinational customers. Maybe just to, to jump in there. I mean, the other challenge is just to really consider just how multinational those multinational customers are. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, certainly from, from you know, the perspective of an enterprise software producer, we, always, we often don't know. I mean, the, the customer, our, our customer may well be, you know, in Ohio or, or wherever they are, but they may have employees all across the world. They may have customers all across the world. They may have operations all across the world. And it just, just came to me maybe, you know, an extreme example. I think very much earlier on, uh, Kate, you mentioned aviation. And, and I've focused a lot on small and medium, so maybe to, to change it a little, if you'll allow me. You know, if you're an aircraft manufacturer, that's a perfect example of how, how much more multinational can you go that those aircraft manufacturers provide live service to pilots sitting in a plane when there is an issue wherever that plane is um you know are they going to say you know we'd love to sell you this aircraft but because of uh data transfer requirements unfortunately we, we can't help you uh, if you have maintenance issues uh, you know here here there or whatever uh, you know obviously these engineers and the aircraft manufacturers are, are the the, the key folks able to deduce the, the, the safety or otherwise of, of an issue to resolve it live through their systems, etc. But I think that the real challenge is, and obviously, you know, that aircraft by definition is designed to fly everywhere in the world where, where any kind of localization or otherwise requirements may or may not exist as the local government uh, decides. But you know, that, that multinational challenge is here, it's huge, it's it's in all parts of, 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 of the economy and, you know, it, global trade more generally, but, but by definition, data can flow and can trickle naturally and does trickle all across the world. So to try and kind of, you know, put a, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a couple hundred years ago uh, viewpoint on it, that you know, things stay naturally within their borders, certainly in that aviation example, I think is a, is a good one to, to just demonstrate just how unrealistic it is. Um, and I, I think there's a risk there that we, we, we decide we want to see it that way or, you know, you know that you know, potentially those uh, you know, re regulatory ideas, etc., might try try and push that viewpoint. Uh, and and then obviously, if they're unaware of the reality of the business operations, uh, then the challenge obviously becomes even more difficult to try and marry the the, the, the regulatory requirement with the the operational task that needs to be undertaken by the business as they try to m maintain compliance. Maybe I'll let's just to give a, a concrete example. Um, so as, as I mentioned, uh, so we, we have Workday. Uh, I have employees who directly report to me who live in Europe. Um, and uh, so when I need to do their annual performance review and I need to decide how much they get paid, uh, I certainly have their personal information in the Workday system coming to me from Europe. And uh, I, I need to know how much they're getting paid because I decide how much they're getting paid. So uh, that uh, um, uh, it's obviously sensitive information, but it has to be. We, we couldn't we couldn't run the the operation um, in all the countries where we do business if we if we can't have that uh, the basic data transfer. Yeah, and I think the, those examples, you, Jim, your example of a global workforce, and Joe, your example of sort of 
marketing products and selling products to a global customer base really highlight the need on both fronts to be able to have data about that workforce, to have data about how those products are used in order to run your company, in order to mm -hmm. support the products that you sell, uh, which are not confined to just one country. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, I wanna turn to you with a slightly different question, uh, but still focusing on you know, how this new framework uh, will affect the U.S. economy. And I, I wanna ask you know, how the framework will help your company to create jobs and serve customers in the mm -hmm. U.S. And, and what exactly, or what, what really will be new or different when that agreement is finalized and in place? Yeah, I, I feel like maybe some ways I was, I was going to this in the last comments, but it is the, it's to increase the ease and reduce the cost of the flow of data, of all the data for all these purposes that we've been talking about, which are essentially our core business operations, but also our, you know, our research in healthcare, our, 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 our monitoring of safety, our support for patients. Um, we are doing all those things now with, with respect to Europe because it's absolutely necessary, but the, the, the framework will make it um, less burdensome. And so what that means literally for the US economy um, so it means uh, less cost wasted on those things and more invested uh, in our research and, and manufacturing and things that are, we're doing productively for the business, um, which has a, a, we have a big footprint and a big impact on the U.S. economy. Um, that means also, frankly, that we will probably, it will enable us to do more research collaboratively with Europe. There's a lot of very good um, medical researchers in Europe. Um, and a lot of, 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 you know, great data that you can study uh, to develop new, new treatments and therapies. And like I was talking about predicting stroke um, and, and, and things like that and managing your diabetes to be able to do uh, kind of access, have access to more researchers and, and um, collaborate more for the, uh, for the great innovations that are going to improve healthcare. That will be made easier also by the framework. Thank you. One other thing that I know companies are looking for from the framework is the certainty it will create in transferring yeah. data across the Atlantic. I want to pull in Barbara and ask, you know, why is that certainty important for companies? Yeah, because the, the decision in SHRMS 2 really focused on government policies as opposed to commercial privacy practices, it's incredibly important for us to have a government to government agreement um, and then to be able to have a negotiated endorsed framework that gives validity, mm -hmm. um, legal weight to transfers from the EU to the US. I think without that, there, there remains the, the question in terms of, is there going to be, well, and there still will be a question in terms of, will there be another challenge in a couple of years? Um, but having this, uh, you know, focus and shift in terms of government policies, I think goes a long way in addressing the concerns that have been at the heart of this issue for years. And so having something that can stand long-term will give greater certainty that our customers can continue to transfer data, continue to have their data brought together and continue to have um, global support. Great, thank you. And I know a lot of our discussion has focused so far on the practical examples, like what data transfers are and why they matter. I think that's that's important for everyone to understand um, just how common data transfers are for businesses across industries, across sizes. But Jake, I want to turn to you and ask, can you help us understand some of the economic data around why data transfers are important and just how important they are? Absolutely. And I, I think Barbara makes a good point with, with the certainty that will be established mm -hmm. as, as we finalize this, this process so that businesses can get back to the business of business of, of their products mm -hmm. and innovation. Um, and if we're able to kind of push this through, uh, the OECD is also looking at, at this issue on government access to data. So hopefully we can build off of the EU-US framework to have a global standard uh, uh, to address this issue. So just in terms of context, though, uh, just some numbers. And, and I, I want to congratulate uh, GDA for pulling these together. So by 2025, which is what, two years out, three years out, we're looking at 6 billion uh, consumers connected to the, the internet. Uh, we're looking at 25 billion connected devices. 
Uh, and that actually may be an understatement as 5G comes online uh, globally in terms of if you're looking at uh, uh, networks uh, for manufacturing to manage uh, you know, petabytes of data uh, for their services uh, and, and production. 60% of gross domestic product will be digitized by the end of 2022. And then 75% of data transfers will come from agriculture, logistics, and manufacturing sectors. So anyone who thinks that this is only a tech issue is sadly mistaken. This, this is an economic issue across the board. Thank you, Jade. Um, I want to remind our audience now, too, that they can use the chat function to submit any questions that they have for our panelists. Uh, but as they do so, I will go ahead and keep our conversation going. And I want to put some questions to all of you. Um, and I guess for the first one, Barbara, I'll turn back to you. Uh, but I would, would like to invite everyone to, to speak to these questions. We've talked about how transferring data internationally is a critical part of offering global services, but it's also a critical part of using global services. You've given us a couple of examples of Workday customers that would use Workday internationally to help manage a global workforce. But can you also help us understand how those transfers matter even to small businesses um, that are based in the US that only may serve customers in the US, but that rely on sort of global tools to do so? Sure. So if even if it was a small U.S. based company, they're very likely using enterprise software um, that's going to need to have support models to be able to going back to the security um, discussion we we're having. That's going to be able to help them be able to do a follow the sun to monitor around the clock. And any of those tools are very likely going to involve global data transfers. It's it's. I feel very unlikely in today's world that even a small company that's you know, servicing a US is not using tools that are going to rely on support staff, on security monitoring that is global in nature and is going to end up requiring data transfers in order to be able to, to protect the data, to look for fraud activity, as um, somebody said earlier, I think it was Jake. Um, and so it's, it's not just a large multinational company issue. It, it really impacts everybody. Yeah, and Joe and Jim, I think earlier uh, each of you stressed that this is important both for you know larger companies but also for smaller and medium enterprises. I want to turn back to that and see if you want to offer additional reasons why. Well I think about uh, our supply chain as an example um, as it uh, we have actually thousands of suppliers uh, because we're a complex manufacturing company and a large percentage of our suppliers are in the US and some of them are, are small and medium enterprises. And they may need to get materials uh, or parts and components from overseas. We, we saw some of this in the, in the pandemic uh, where we, we would have a US supplier, uh, but it would need a component from Malaysia and Malaysia was restricting the export because of, because of COVID. But it, that demonstrated how interconnected the whole supply chain is and that the US company, even though it it wasn't uh, itself in Malaysia, was re was relying on, on, on the airport and their ability to supply their US product to our American factory was was impacted by by uh, global transfers. And so I think that it, it, it even for the, the small and medium enterprises, the, the con complex in interwoven global supply chain means these issues are going to uh, have impact uh, all over values, all over value chains, and that this ability to to transfer data is is going to be you know crucial for many aspects of the economy. I think for for maybe on on the larger side, I think even to, to my my own former employer, but you know a, a grocery store would be a, a perfect example for your complicated supply chain transparency, mm -hmm. uh, you know challenge as well, and and also a safety topic. Uh, you know, it's even though it's a product we're talking about you know, food product or whatever it is, that may well come with it, a certification requirement as part of, Jake could probably speak to this better than, than I would, but, you know, as part of the import requirements that a, a vet might have to certify that ABC or whatever it is, you know, huge examples there. But I also wanted to, 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 
to, to say that you know you might be a, an American manufacturer or service provider and not also aware that you know your your, your sub suppliers or your, mm-hmm. your your supply chain comes from abroad at all. <laughs> so you, you might you know erroneously think, well, this wouldn't wouldn't affect me because I I of course just order it from the the the, the, the fellow down the road uh, and he uh, or she obviously then is the one that deals with this challenge. And I think that's really what we saw during the the the. the, the the, the COVID crisis or, or when it was at its peak, but people weren't ultimately aware, but obviously became aware very quickly when, when the supplies didn't, didn't arrive. And I know there are physical asset examples, obviously from the service industry perspective, as you can imagine, it's going to be much quicker, uh, much more direct. Um, you know, uh, uh, we're not just talking about controller and processors here, but, you know, sub processors and various other built in, uh, you know, entities, I think the security example we, we already gave, but, uh, you know, a lot of the softwares we use today um, in our personal life, but also that small enterprises use have sub, sub components or packages that are coming from different companies, uh, all, all blended together to create that single package, or they work well in cooperation with some other package. So uh, I think, you know, ultimately it's, 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 it's there whether folks choose to see it or not. Uh, and and hopefully it it never comes to a scenario where they become aware of it because of what we in the same way that we became aware of supply chain issues of goods dur- during uh, during COVID. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I, I recognize our time is getting short, and this hour has really flown by. Uh, but I want to give every panelist an opportunity to answer sort of a final question, uh, which is if you had to give our audience today just one key takeaway about international data transfers in the new agreement on the EU-US data privacy framework, you know, what is that takeaway? And Joe, I'll, I'll turn back to you first, and then we'll sort of go down the line. You said one, I'm gonna break the rule and give you three, <laughs> but they're very short, I promise. There's comfort where until recently there was a lot of doubt. It gives certainty for those who might've been holding off on potential expansion, potential uh, new products, new markets. And finally, it really demonstrates you know, uh, US EU cooperation on very complicated challenges to our mutual benefit. Thank you. Barbara, I see you nodding. So I'll turn to you next. What is your <laughs> takeaway? I agree with uh, everything that Joe said, but I mean, it's it's a very positive forward in continuing the free flow of personal data from the EU, including employee data um, to the US. And just as we've been talking about this seamless transfer of data, um, plays a vital role in continuing to drive the digital economy and enabling multinational companies to really um, manage their global workforces, their global businesses. So we are extremely supportive of this and looking forward to the future adequacy decision. Thanks, Barbara. Jake, I'm going to tap you next uh, for an, a takeaway for the audience. Oh, thanks. Well, since Joe got to do three, can I do three? No, uh, you know, I, I think Joe did, did a great job. The, the only thing I'd, I'd add to, to what Joe and Barbara said is uh, that it's it's not a tech issue. Uh, data transfers cuts across the board, uh, all sectors of the economy, uh, small, medium, large businesses. Uh, it, it is just crucial to the operations of, of any service or manufacturing product. All right, thank you. And Jim, uh, you'll have the last word on, on the takeaways here. It's, it's the penalty of going last because Jake just said what, what I was gonna say, which is, you know, <laughs> It is it is in every aspect of the economy. Um, the, the data transfers I mean, for, for most industries, either for sales or supply chain, um, there's international business is a key part of the business and any type of international business is going to require data transfers for core operations and for basic business. It's not just a tech issue. So um, strengthening the trust and the security and the and making easier the mechanisms for doing that so we all can have confidence about it is, is just a hugely important issue across the economy. All right. Thank you all. I think that's a really helpful set of takeaways to leave our audience with. Um, and with that, I just want to thank our speakers for joining our discussion today and to thank everyone in the audience for attending. I hope you found it informative. Um, On behalf of BSA and GDA, I want to say how much we appreciate everyone's time. So thank you for tuning in. We always welcome more questions and feedback. Feel free to connect with us, bsa.org, globaldataalliance.org. But with that, we will close out the event and wish everyone a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.